I'm Dominic Wilkinson. I'm Professor of Medical Ethics at the Oxford Uhiro Centre for Practical Ethics. And I'm very excited that our book, co-authored with Professor Julian Savalescu from the National University of Singapore, Pandemic Ethics from COVID-19 to Disease X, has just been published by Oxford University Press. The aim of this book is to show that philosophy and ethics are as important as science in dealing with a pandemic informing policy. Philosophy and ethics deal with the most profound questions of human life. What is good in human life? What is the value of human life? How should benefits and burdens or scarce resources be distributed amongst people? And how do we weigh well-being against liberty? These are ethical and philosophical questions, not scientific questions, but questions that have to be answered if we're to form policy in a pandemic. The point of this book is to illustrate the importance of ethics in making those decisions. To decide what should be our metric of success or failure, we need to decide what's good and what we should be aiming to maximise or achieve. And that requires ethical endpoints. This book is not a systematic coverage of all of the ethical issues associated with decision-making in a pandemic that would require an encyclopedia of ethics. It's meant to illustrate uh, the importance of ethics to this kind of decision-making. For the next pandemic, we'll need not only good science, um, but better ethics. In the COVID pandemic, my life, the life of millions, billions around the world changed radically. Ethicists like myself suddenly turned to a whole series of important issues that they were facing in their countries. And as the pandemic wound up, we brought together a group of experts in ethics, law and philosophy to reflect on the things that they had learned from COVID-19 to think about future pandemics. For example, in the book, the great moral philosopher Francis Cam from Harvard critically examines some of the libertarian arguments that were raging in the pandemic in relation to mandates for vaccines or lockdowns. A group of economists from the US and the UK, including London School of Economics, examined the difficult trade-offs between the economy and protecting health and well-being, thinking about how we should measure those how we should calculate and factor those into future difficult decisions. I'm here with Professor Mike Parker, uh, who's one of the authors from the Pandemic Ethics book. Mike, pandemics often arise not in countries like the UK, um, but in low and middle income countries. Why does that matter ethically? It matters in a whole range of ways. If you think about pandemics as a global problem, I think it raises questions relating to the fact that people in, in, in those parts of the world are essentially living on the front line of global efforts to prevent and respond to pandemics. So one question is, what are their responsibilities and what are the responsibilities of the rest of the world to them? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this book coming out, partly because I think these, the problems identified here are really important ones. So I see it as an agenda setting book for one thing. And I hope that this will generate a whole new area of research. But secondly, because it's bringing together some really key people who've been involved at a very high level in global efforts and national efforts to, to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. So in so, some senses, it's a document which captures thought, you know, it's been generated by very recent experience of people. So I'm yeah, excited to read it. I think the key thing that I would want people to take away from the book is to think about pandemic ethics as something which needs to take serious account of preparedness, response and prevention. Virtually no one is writing on the ethics of pandemic prevention at the moment and uh, attention needs to be paid to that. So one of the striking things with the COVID-19 pandemic is that there were stratifications of risk. There were high risk groups um, and, and the most obvious high risk group were, were older people, such as myself. Um, people over the age of 50 or 55, would selective restriction of liberty, selective coercion, in this case, selective mandatory vaccination be justified? 
So in my chapter, I explore whether selective lockdown, selective mandatory vaccination could be justified. And indeed, some countries did employ this. Um, for example, Greece and Italy um, imposed fines for people over a certain age, 55 or 65, um, in order to um, promote their uptake of vaccination in those groups. That's a form of selective mandatory vaccination. The, the, the other sort of um, slogans of the pandemic were, we, we are all in this together and, and no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, now, in one sense, those slogans are, are incorrect um, because younger people were not at a significantly elevated risk um, of dying from, from COVID. Um, and the, the question that should be asked ethically is, uh, because the benefits and burdens f f fall on different people differently from um, restriction of liberty, um, should um, liberties be selectively restricted and focused on those with, with the most to gain? We've only just recovered from COVID-19, but some estimates suggest that there's a more than one in four chance in the next decade of another pandemic just as bad. And actually many scientists for years have been worried about pandemics that we face that may be much worse than COVID-19. We all want to forget this pandemic, but actually we need to remember and learn from it because there may be worse ahead. Mm -hmm.